Hello, STEM Nation. Jeff here, and welcome to episode number 16 of STEM on Fire, where we interview practicing professionals in the area of science, technology, engineering, and math to help guide students interested in STEM careers. If you like what you hear on this podcast, I ask that you please share it with a friend. Now let's get fired up today with our guest, Salam, and I hope our chat will help ignite your passion towards a STEM career. Salam earned his PhD in electrical and computer engineering from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee and had various internships through college and has been focused on renewable power storage and the microgrid, and is currently a power engineer at Eaton Corporation. Welcome to the show, Salam. Fill in any gaps and share a bit of your personal life. Yeah, hi, Jeff. Thanks for having me here. Uh, Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Salam Bani Ahmed. Um, uh, I think my bio wasn't that that big because technically I'm still a student, but... uh, I've been a student for the past 26 years. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and uh, I got my bachelor's degree um, from Jordan, uh, where I'm originally from, uh, in engineering technology, uh, specified in, uh, in computer engineering. Uh, but then I went for my master's degree and uh, from University of uh, uh, Jordan University uh, of Science and Technology, also in computer engineering. Uh, and right now, I'm almost done, hopefully, uh, uh, with my PhD. I'm earning my PhD degree from University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. All right. Sounds good, Salam. So let's dig right in here. So you, you've you got a computer engineering um, undergrad, and then you've got a electrical and computer engineering master's and focused on power. So for someone not familiar with power systems engineering, can you give some examples of career opportunities? Absolutely. So uh, a power systems engineer, uh, it can it, it can be uh, can be referred to as an energy engineer, or a, a probably a renewable systems engineer. Uh, there are a lot of uh, positions that can be filled uh, by a person who's uh, who's uh, uh, who knows in power system engineering. Uh, but generally, uh, thinking about power systems engineer, uh, my my focus is uh, is on the smart grid part. The smart grid is, uh, you can look at it as, uh, or you can refer to it as the smart power system. Because uh, the, the previous power systems, uh, or the, the even the current power system, doesn't have that digital part uh, that helps control and monitor everything. Uh, usually it's monitored locally. Uh, now there is a need because of the internet and uh, all of, um, of the other uh, intelligent technology that uh, that's that's uh, up on the table right now, uh, which required uh, more professionals and engineer to dig in and uh, try to build this smart grid or a smart power system. And uh, th- 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 starting with thinking about a power engineer, uh, previously it might be limited to, to knowledge in electrical power systems. Uh, regardless the size uh, from transmission or distribution, but uh, the thing that we need to uh, to make sure that we know here is that the power system engineer now must have knowledge uh, in other disciplines, and uh, I think we'll get to that later. Yeah. So when you're talking about the grid, you're talking about the power lines going around the country, correct? Absolutely. So the power lines is one portion of that because the power lines are uh, the transmission lines, which brings your uh, uh, delivers the electricity from the generation uh, units or power plants, which might be uh, like uh, in a distant areas. The power lines may involve actually the distribution system, which is the smaller power lines or the smaller poles that you will see in your residential areas. So you're saying that with uh with the current power grid and and being kind of modernized with I'll say computer control, so do you think it's it's valuable that you have the computer engineering background versus just a straight electrical engineering degree? To me, it was actually yes, because uh, this is one of the reasons uh, that I went to the smart grid field. My knowledge in and then uh, my knowledge in computer engineering helped a lot building my career when it comes to to electrical engineering because uh, now I actually can uh, can dig more into the computer side or the digital side of the smart grid and my knowledge into the electrical system 
uh, helped a lot connect the dots between these two, two, two different, two different worlds in a way. And uh, that, that's that's actually very important. And uh, it's what's what's more important is that we should collect some knowledge into multiple disciplines, multiple engineering disciplines. For example, uh, I may have uh, if I need to work with uh, with uh, transformers, I need to uh, to follow the the electrical engineering side. But if I work with generators, it's not enough to know the electrical side of it. You have to know the mechanical side of it. So they're all melted together. That's why right now with smart grid or with modern uh, modern power systems, you have uh, you actually have a melted disciplines which are the computer or the networks engineering part and of course the the power engineering part so it sounds like you've got software hardware in the form of digital control and then you've got analog power along with mechanical aspects all intertwined together for the power systems engineer absolutely yes that's that's very precise yeah and how important was it to have the PhD versus just an undergrad or a master's degree to to do the work that you're doing today? Where I came from, I started with computer engineering and uh, electrical engineering. Going for a PhD had a reason uh, for for a good reason to me because I needed to to learn some sol- uh, problem solving techniques. Now, uh, if you, if you go to the industry um, or the academic institutions, uh, you will see PhD holders. They have more capability of uh, finding uh, proper solutions to to day to day problems, because that's what uh, where we learned during our PhD studies. As an undergrad, I'm not saying the undergrad uh, would not have this skill, but problem solving uh, is something that you train your brain to do. It's not. Uh, sometimes it's a gift, but when it comes to an area of expertise, uh, the problem-solving technique should should you should be trained, and you should uh, face problems every day and learn how to to solve them based on your knowledge or based on your background, and try to mix things together, thinking outside the box, stuff like that. Yeah, and I'll say STEM Nation, a lot of what engineering degrees are and in the STEM field, it it teaches you how to solve problems. And you're going to learn a lot in college, but you're going to learn a lot more out in the real world in your day-to-day job. So, Salam, let's dig in and let's get really specific here. And what is exactly your area of expertise? But my work actually falls uh, into the microgrids. A microgrid is... um, a small grid or a small size grid or a small scaled down grid uh, like our residential areas uh, where we can integrate renewable resources such as wind and solar uh, solar systems uh, and of course we can have some backup generators uh, we can have energy storage into it so a microgrid it's like a starfish it can have a lot of a lot of shapes a lot of colors uh, the concept is the same, but the challenge is still there, which is uh, the integration part of different resources that had different natures, and they share the same the same bus. So my work actually involves uh, the control part and involves the, the control uh, layer or the control system where all of these uh, components that I mentioned uh, are connected through two points. One point is the electrical point because they they share the same bus, and uh, that bus can can have certain loads like a, like a house. The second point of connection would be the the control layer, where they exchange information with a centralized controller, or uh, if there is a decentralized architecture to it, uh, they actually exchange data in order to maintain a microgrid operation running smoothly. So my focus, I would say, it's uh, it's actually uh, uh, communication and cyber physical layer of a microgrid. You said cyber physical layer. What does what does that mean exactly? A cyber physical system is uh, that, that's that's actually a great question. I had I had a nice talk last last week with it, about it. So a cyber physical system is a system that we know it doesn't have the cyber part or it doesn't have the communications part. But right now, this system, we need to add this cyber layer 
or the communication layer into it in order to achieve better performance or better reliability and better uh, better uh, uh, resiliency for that system in order to uh, in order to to rely on that system for years uh, uh, with minimum with minimum minimum maintenance and uh, and of course uh, minimum cost of operation. So is the ultimate goal to have just a more reliable power grid for the for the world? Absolutely, absolutely. So the reliability of power grid is essential because. Uh, when it comes to uh, to uh, cyber attacks, when it comes to natural disasters, uh, there is always the first the first thing we lose is power. So uh, the, having a reliable power grid that we can we can rely on, uh, even when there are some some natural disasters or any uh, other reasons they might we might have an outage for, uh, I think it's essential. And microgrids by itself. Uh, I think it's it's a good solution for that because in a, in a residential area we can have a microgrid. So even if we lose the power from the utility grid, uh, the microgrid should be able to support the local loads, which can be a bunch of houses in that area. So Salam, are you you're working for Eaton, and you're also still finishing up your PhD uh, degree at University of Wisconsin Milwaukee? Are you working with Eaton with uh, UW Milwaukee, or how does that work? Uh, in our lab, we do a lot of collaborative work with the industry, and Eaton is one of the, the companies that actually we work closely with, uh, shared projects from our side and their side, uh, submit uh, proposals uh, for, for, uh, to, provide, to get funding for uh, certain projects. And, uh, and of course, uh, through that interaction with Eaton uh, over the years, uh, right now, um, I'm a part-time student there, uh, part-time, part-time power engineer with them. Uh, actually, uh, I'm working on the same thing that I learned uh, in my lab. Yeah, it sounds like good collaboration between industry and school and then opportunities for employment. So that's awesome. So let's get fired up here. And what is one thing that really has you fired up about power systems engineering and where do you see it headed? In 2011, I was watching a webinar uh, back home in Jordan, and uh, it was they were talking about uh, the lack of the IT representation or the information technology representation into the power systems, which means that they're trying to to build the idea or to create the idea of smart grids and make it a fact instead of uh, uh, instead of an, just an idea. So they, they, there was uh, the speaker. He has uh, an urge. Uh, he was um, he was urging the people, if you are an IT guy, don't be uh, don't hesitate to go into the power system field, because now with your knowledge there, you will benefit the power system side. And if you are a power systems engineer, there is no harm of you to know the IT side of it because right now when you think, you're not thinking power systems, you're not thinking information technology, you're thinking smart grid, which is the, the rea- reality that's going to be there. Uh, uh, and you, we will definitely see it uh, in the near future and the very far future because there is no, there will be no end to this. So I think 2011 was my great start with this. And uh, I decide, then I decided whenever I'm going to go for my PhD, this is going to be my thing. Yes, Demnation, you, you always got to keep your eyes and ears open. You never know what you're going to see or read that's really going to spark that fire in you. Like Salam, you know, looking at a webinar and realizing, you know what, that's what I'm going to do. Uh, so keep your eyes open and, and keep your options open. So Salam, we're going to go to an aha moment. Can you take us to a moment in time of an incredible aha moment you've had at work or your personal life and tell us a story and how you turn that aha moment into success? Uh, one day during my master's degree, I received an email. I was actually contacted by a Google recruiter. He mentioned that they're looking uh, for uh, certain people to do some, to some, um, some work or some software work because my background in computer engineering. So at that moment when I received the email and I read that, okay, if Google can be or may be interested in me, what about the rest? So uh, actually at that time I was preparing to, to, uh, to attend uh, uh, a quick or an intensive PhD course in Italy in 2010. Uh, at that time, uh, 
the speaker, one of the speakers was uh, an engineer, a big engineer from Google. So when I went there, I told him, uh, I need to ask you something. I got this uh, interview request from Google, but at the same time, I'm planning to go for my PhD. What do you think I should do? He said, if Google or any other company is interested in you right now, they will always be interested in you. So my, my advice to you is to go for your PhD and uh, build your focus on the, the industrial part of the or uh, the theory part at the same time try to connect with the industry so you can get more knowledge so when you go to the industry field you would be ready yeah and also you 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 went out and you went to conferences you're you're broadening your network you're actually going out and reaching these people asking them for advice and then actually taking their advice absolutely and taking action and that's so important stem nation you know get out there meet people build that network Listen for advice, ask for advice, and and take that advice. You know, a lot of the people out in the industry, they know what they're talking about. They know what the industry needs. So follow that. So now, Salam, if you could go back to when you were 18, heading off to college, what are some things that you wish you knew back then that you think would help STEMers launch into college successfully? Back then, I would have uh, put more effort on basics, to be honest, which I ended up, of course, studying again, such as uh, physics chemistry, and math. Believe it or not, as a power systems engineer, you need chemistry because one of the parts, one of the big parts of the power system right now is the energy storage. And the energy storage is actually uh, is actually a chemistry research, more of an electrical research. Uh, the second thing, which is socially important, I think, uh, I would have surrounded myself with people I look up to, not who look up to me. Uh, I'm not going to dig it more into this, but I think uh, the, the idea is there. Uh, the one thing that I can say that I knew back then, and I actually followed, uh, is that I should never wait until the last moment to do what I have to do. I used to spend less time studying for midterms and finals, of course, because of that 30 minutes that I spent going over what I received that day in class. Someday... Some days I actually miss, but I kept most of this trend going. So it's all about time management. I, to, to, to sum up all of that, one of the most important things that you should do as a stimmer, you should t- manage your time wisely. Yep, manage your time wisely. And I'll go back to your comment about surrounding yourself with people that are that are smarter than you, people that you want to aspire to, that's who you want to surround yourself with, not the people that are looking up to you, because that's not going to drive you to the next place where you need to be. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, uh, it, it's okay to have people around you, who, people who care about you. But when it comes to your career, uh, always find somebody who you want to be like, or you want to do the same thing, somebody who can you can who, who you can learn from not people who will drag you down. Uh, uh, I'm not saying fun-wise, of course, have fun, but sometimes you have to be serious when it comes to your career. Yeah, absolutely. You have to take it serious. And I'm not saying that, you know, people hanging around you that, you know, are looking for some help because you, you, you also want to give guidance to people that are looking for guidance, right? Because the people that you're surrounding yourself with on where you want to get to. There's also people that want you in their circle because they're trying to aspire to where you want to be. So just be cognizant of the people that are bringing you down. Those are not the people you want in your circle. You want the people that are going to lift you up. And then if you can help lift other people up, it, it just going to, your life is going to be so much better doing that. Absolutely. Absolutely. You need, you need to provide help to people, especially if you're, if you've been, uh, into something that you got experience with, uh, you will get questions about that. That's, that's not the part where I mentioned, uh, uh, that when I mentioned that people will look up to you, some people will look up to you that, that they will not, uh, will not uh, allow you to, to, to succeed. But some people, they look up to you because they want to be like you. That actually, one, one, well, that's a, an important uh, part of your life where you actually provide assistance to people or save time for these people who wants to, to be like you or even better than you. 
And that's why we're doing this podcast, Stem Nation, is so that you can get familiar and you can actually surround yourself with the people on this podcast. You don't have to know them directly. It can be a virtual relationship and listen to their advice, take their advice, and, you know, kind of have them in your inner circle. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's correct. So we're going to take a quick pause here. and We're going to thank our sponsor, Audible, who's offering a free audiobook. You can head over to stemonfirebook.com. That's stemonfirebook.com to get your free audiobook. And now, Salam, are you ready for the lightning round? Absolutely. Bring it on. What is the best piece of advice you've ever received? That would be uh, my dad's advice or one of the advices from, from my dad, uh, which was do not get angry. Always count to 10. Do not get angry. Always count to 10. And how do you utilize that in real life? Sometimes you will have some social problems or uh, dealing with people, with customers, with, uh, with clients, uh, with your boss, with your colleagues. Uh, sometimes you will get fired up for the wrong reason. That's why if you keep in mind, do not get angry, always count to 10 and sometimes count to 11 because everybody's counting to 10. Uh, count to 11 and think before you say the next thing because that's the, the most thing that we regret is the things that we say when, our, when we are angry. Yeah, and, and STEM Nation, if you go back to Teresa Hutton's podcast, she talked about the same thing. Be deliberate with your words because your words can really hurt somebody. So if you don't count to 10 or to 11 before you speak, you don't know what that what impact that's going to have on somebody else's life. And Salam, what is a personal habit that contributes to your success? I would say there are two of them. Uh, one of them, um, I wake up early and I have my breakfast. Believe me, that's magic. <laughs> <laughs> the breakfast or the getting up early? Both, actually. Both. All right. And what's your favorite internet resource or phone app and why? Um, I can say um, I'm an, uh, that I'm an addict to uh, National Geographic. All right. And what is one book you recommend and why? Believe it or not, I grew up reading the dictionary. I know Google might, might look like a faster choice, but um, it won't stick. And Salam, as we wrap up here, can you share a parting piece of guidance for STEM Nation? And then we'll say goodbye. I've had a good life, and uh, I actually uh, believed in one thing. I believe that wherever you go, uh, whatever you choose as a path for your career, I assure you that you will hit rock bottom sometime. Hitting rock bottom, it's not bad. That's okay. Uh, It reminds you that you should work harder and harder. The way I do it, I like to put my heart, mind, and soul into uh, even the smallest acts. If you if you ever go to the to if you ever started a career uh, in engineering or any uh, STEM field, um, I suggest that you feel you, you you learn that field good enough so you can have a small talk about what you do without feeling hesitant to say anything. Once you're able to to, to talk about what you do, that means that you succeeded and achieving what, 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 what you, you've been working on for all of your college time. All right, Salam, with that, we'll say goodbye. All right, goodbye. Thank you, Jeff. I hope you enjoyed our discussion today with Salam. Head on over to stemonfire.com, subscribe to the email list to keep up with the latest happenings, and be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play. And again, if you are getting value from this podcast, please share it with a friend. Tune in next week where we talk with Christina, who is a civil engineer who works for Las Vegas and is the president of the Society of Civil Engineers. Until next time, I hope this chat has helped ignite your passion towards a STEM career.